Welcome to the CSD seminar. I believe uh, today we have a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Kangook Lee as our speaker. Kangook is an assistant, assistant professor at, at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. And prior to joining, uh, starting his current position, he completed his PhD in UC Berkeley ECS and spent a few years as a postdoc slash research assistant professor at Geist, South Korea. And um, his research interests span um, diverse fields, including machine learning and information theory, and he has done many cool works. Um, today, he's going to tell us about his recent works on theoretical foundations and fine tuning methods. I hope the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Dergit, for um, everything. Um, and thanks for attending my talk. I guess um, this is the um, the last day of the semester, um, so assuming that um, everyone wants to get out of the campus and have some fun. But thanks for staying in the, uh, the last day of the semester with me. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to um, share my um, recent work um, focusing on parameter efficient fine tuning methods. Um, I'm going to give you um, maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes about what primary efficient fine tunings are and how powerful they are in practice. And also, what kind of theoretical understanding we can have about them. And let's say the last 10 to 15 minutes, I will also talk a little bit more about something beyond fine tuning. Um, and that will be um, the end of the talk. So let's get started. So, So what do we mean by um, primary efficient fine tuning? So let's say uh, imagine that this, the bigger box here is the, uh, the entire neural network's model parameters. We denote it by theta, and I have this ice cube icon over there, which denotes that most of the model parameters are fixed or frozen. By the what I mean is I'm not going to update this model parameter during training or during the adaptive phase. I uh, keep them constant. Instead, I'm going to introduce a, a small number of parameters, either um, the existing parameters or new parameters, either particularly parameterized in a certain way or not. I choose some certain number of parameters, and I'm going to only train those parameters. I'm going to call them adapter, and then the file logo icon is um, representing that those parameters are not frozen, and they will be trained and learned. So, um, so of course, these figures are not set up with the uh, eventually. In fact, as we want this uh, the size of the smaller um, adapter box is much much smaller compared to the bigger box, so that we actually get the efficiency part out of it. But um, why do we want this kind of tuning method? There are um, four different method reasons why we want to use this kind of efficient fine tuning. Um, intuitively, it uses a less number of model parameters when it comes to adaptation. So it is obvious that it's less prone to catastrophic forgetting, which could happen if you train all the model parameters. Another uh, advantage is, as you guys all know, when you're uh, training your model parameters, you have to have extra memory cost for models that are going to be trained because you have to keep track of the activations for backpropagation, for momentum methods like Adam, um, you have to also keep track of the means and variances. So you have extra uh, memory cost associated with the models that are being trained. Uh, if you minimize the number of model parameters to train, you have much less memory cost at, at, at the training time. Another good thing about the thing is these days, uh, a lot of people are using foundation models. Uh, those are the big trained models that are um, shared across the people. Um, therefore, if you assume that these bigger uh, frozen models are available to all the people out there, if you want to share your updated model, you only need to share the, the different, not the entire model parameters. You can only share this the delta, which is the, the parameters associated with the adapter. Then you can actually easily share or store your checkpoints corresponding to your adaptation without having much storage overhead. The last component, last part is the modularity. So the modularity comes from, because this adapter is making, um, is only um, the small number of parameters compared to the entire number of parameters. 
So um, there are a few interesting phenomena people are observing these days. I think the, um, our understanding of this modularity is still very limited. So I'm going to share a few interesting ideas that people are finding in this space. So by composability, what I mean is if you fine tune your pre-train -pre model on task one, and you get one adapter out of it. If you, again, you start from scratch, you take the uh, pre-train model again, and you fine tune on task two, and you get the adapter two. And you get um, one that delta one, delta theta one from test one, you get delta theta two from test two. What I mean by composability is at test time, if you just literally add delta theta one and delta theta two and see what the model does, it actually behaves in, uh, the model is able to solve the two tasks at the same time. This is something that people are observing in practice. That's what I mean by composability which is not something that we see uh, if you consider the uh, entire model parameter just added together because usually you don't, you, the, the added model parameter don't solve any of the two tasks. So this is something new that people are finding about this modular um, modularity pro properties. Transferability is also some new uh, phenomenon that people are seeing across different problems where um, you train one adapter on pre-trained model one, and in certain cases, that adapter can be actually used for a different pre-trained model, which is somewhat mind-blowing because why is the adapter trained on pre-trained one useful at all for some different pre-trained model? So this is uh, completely mysterious for now, but there are some interesting modularity going on. All right, so these are the four high levels on why um, you should care about PFT or primary efficient fine tuning. And today I'm going to talk about uh, three different things. First, uh, how I got into um, studying this um, new topic called PFT. In fact, my personal journey was I started with this GPT fine tuning or the net large language model fine tuning. And I wanted to learn more about how much GPT fine tuning can, how much, uh, how, much, how many high diverse tasks GPT fine tuning can solve. That was my first question. And as I was personally curious about how this um, open AI service is, is even possible because they were serving millions of customized GPTs. I'll tell you more about it. And that kind of question um, made me think more about PFT about a few years ago. I'll tell you some stories about it. And then uh, the main part of this talk will be the theoretical analysis of uh, primary efficient fine-tuning methods. And in fact, I'm gonna focus on the expressive power, um, focusing on the DORA. And there's another method called side tuning. I will use two different theoretical tools or framework. The first one will use the, the functional approximation viewpoint. The second one will talk about the memorization capacity. I'll explain what those things are later. Lastly, um, I will wrap up the talk by talking about what about um, things that we can do without any fine tuning. What are the limits of um, no fine tuning methods? What I mean by that, like prompting could be one example or developing a system or designing a system with the loops and control loops will be one example of designing a system without any fine tuning. Um, feel free to um, interrupt me anytime if you guys have any questions. Um, happy to make it more, um, more for less formal than it used to be. All right, um, let's start with the first part. Uh, I guess everyone is now aware of uh, what lang large language models are, which is just a pretty good next word predictor. So let's start with the um, um, quiz. What's the answer? 23, good. That's it. Sorry again, 82, um, no, no, maybe I'm missing something, um, 
150. It's just like adding two numbers, third number, adding two numbers, third number. Cool. Last question. Kind of quote, but cheers. <laughs> so um, this is just examples of um, what guys and models are doing. And uh, in fact, you guys were um, solving this multiple questions uh, without me explicitly telling what you have to do. Right? This here, you were predicting um, the next prime number, even if I didn't tell you anything about what the problem is. You guys were doing order translation. You guys were doing addition um, by learning the parents from the additions. You guys were doing um, uh, making sense, uh, common sense about Wisconsin, which is the uh, state. Cool. Um, that's cool. Um, so GP three um came out in like twenty nineteen ish. Um, and they have been serving API services since then. And when I was first seeing the GPT three models and seeing how these people are playing with them, I already thought that GPT three is only for NLP task. And I've never worked with NLP. I never took any NLP courses before. I didn't know, I still don't know anything about NLP. So I was like, okay, that's so cool, but um, this has nothing to do with me. But in 2021, July, they actually added a new feature called a fine tuning feature. So what it does is users uh, can literally upload a text file, like literally a text file, a raw text file, including your own data set. And you upload it to OpenAI. And OpenAI has um, charges depending on how large the data set is. And they fine tune GPT 3 for you. And once the fine tuning is completed, you get your own API access. Then you can see how good these fine tuned models are. You can still use that. Um, became much cheaper than before. But then there's some uh, natural question that follows because the GPT 3 model is known to be, have 170. Five billion parameters in floating point 16, it means 350 gigabytes. Even with four bit quantization, it becomes 87.5 gigabytes. And it's completely impossible to create this new model checkpoint every time I request this fine tuning model service. So, pretty sure, because even if you try um, fine tuning with like one line of text file. It probably changes the entire model parameters little by little. So you still have to keep the entire file unless you do some kind of delta encoding. And, and also there was no limit in terms of how many models you could make. So I was actually making like tens of models every day. So in fact, I was 100% sure this is the clear evidence that these guys are using PFT. And this is, I'm pretty sure this is the first um, large scale PFT that uh, we have seen deployed in the system. So let's assume that um, GPT is using some PFT. We still don't know uh, what PFT method they are using, but I assume that they are using some PFT method. And this is the first research question I had. Um, what can you do with it? Like, uh, okay, PFT seems cool. I only saw it in the papers. I was reviewing some papers on PFT. Uh, it looks cool, but never used it. But now GPT is equipped with this PFT um, service. So why don't I try with many different PFT um, tasks with different data sets, different tasks, and see how good GPTs can be transformed to a different model. The second question, this is not a research question. I was curious, um, purely curious about, about which method they are using. Um, there are so many PFT methods um, that were proposed before 21. And which one they have chosen, I was curious about it. So the answer to the first question, uh, we um, kind of turns out to be our paper at the last last year called Lit. Um, the question, um, research question we answered, tried to answer in this paper was, well, um, going back to my first question, is GPT really for NLP? Or can GPT be used for completely non-linguistic tasks or non-linguistic task once you're able to fine tune the model. Okay. So the answer to that question is yes. If you are able to, if you can apply PFT method to GPT-3, you can actually turn GPT-3 into something completely different. So I'll show you some examples. Let's start with the simpler one. So this is the iris classification data set. You have these four features, numerical features, um, width and length, 
and you want to have three-way classification between three different types of high-risk flowers. This is the experiment we ran. We converted each of the training sentence, training um, row into a, an English sentence. The first row becomes an iris plant with lens, blah, blah, with blah, blah, and so on. And the end of the, at the end of the sentence is iris septosa. Okay. So if the GPT is fine-tuned on this kind of text data, then you can actually implement a classifier because the model will give us this kind of feature information. And predicting the next word at the end of the sentence will become basically a classifier. So we fine tune GPT with this data set. We uploaded this text data set converted from the, the raw um, iris classification data set. We also converted the text data set, test data set to text, but we only um, pointed the model up to here and see what the model says. Then we will predict one of the three classes. And sure, now we measure the um, accuracy. It actually measures, gets like 98% accuracy. Okay, so um, let's go even wider. Let's try MNIST. What we did was we take each of the MNIST images and make into a sequence of uh, zero, zero and pixel values. Will this work? Any guess? Worked very well. Okay. In fact, um, I claim that this is the, uh, the initial version of GPT-3 we created, which is extremely inefficient because it was sent at, um, the image pixel by pixel written in uh, digits. Um, what about regression? Uh, we created a bunch of function classes like this. These are the different function classes we tested. What we did was we created a fine-tuning data set. Those small blue dots on the xy plane are the sample point, sample x values. We sample the corresponding function value, and then we fine-tune on that data set. And the remaining function is um, visualized by inferencing the model on the entire grid. And you, you can visualize the learned function. You can see that the model is able to learn almost all possible function classes. In fact, I think um, this paper is pretty popular, which came a little after our work. They actually did something very similar to what we did, but they tested this uh, regression or function feeding capability of transformers with in-context examples, while we were testing this properties with the primary efficient fine tuning. Um, again, um, talked about these things. Uh, in, in fact, most of, most of the popular classification data set, regression data that we tested, we are actually pretty much similar to the state of the art methods, as well as for MNIST, you get 98%. So you get pretty much good performance compared to the like even better than the net. Uh, let's go one more wilder. Can you make an image generator? Well, the idea was this um, after we submitted our paper, um, during the rebutter, um, before the rebutter, we thought about this crazy idea. What if we could change the order of the temperature? Right? The previous uh, image classification, we first give the um, pixel sequence, and it was ending with this image is digit three to digit four. But now we change the order. And then once you fine tune your model with this kind of sentences in this reverse order, if the model is prompted with a, an image of digit four, then then the next word prediction will predict the possible sequence of pixels. And you can visualize whether that makes some sense or not. So we tested this, and these are the some of the sample images you get from the data, from the model. You see that it's not perfect, but it's still drawing some um, unseen numbers like this. So <clears throat> that was the answer to the first question. So basically, the short answer is PFT, even though you only use maybe 10 megabytes of um, parameters to update the model, you can turn GPT or large language models into something completely different. That's completely out of domain in terms of input or task to both. So the short answer is, is extremely expensive. Question two, which PFT method they are using? GPT-3, again, um, this fine tuning feature came in July. Um, June, June 21, a month before they added this feature, this paper came out for the LoRa, it's short for low rank adaptation. I'll explain what this LoRa is. And if you look at the, tape, uh, the tables they have, they actually have this uh, suspicious uh, model called GPT-3 because there's no way you can find 2 GPT-3 unless you're actually working with OpenAI. 
and they were having this table um, uh, in the table in the paper, basically saying that um, I think it is very reasonable to believe that LoRa will develop particularly for OpenAI's uh, fine tuning services. So not just me, I guess um, for sure, but many people kind of guess that LoRa is the secret sauce behind this large scale GPT three fine tuning services. Um, but um, nobody confirmed it until this June or May. So um, there was a like um, YouTube video where uh, one of the uh, developers from Microsoft came out. <laughs> I mentioned that GPT-3 model you know, at one team. point, which has 175 yes, okay. billion parameters. So if you just fine tune that using the basic fine tuning technique, it would require 96 GPUs. And each checkpoint during that fine tuning training would be about a terabyte in size. To make that more efficient, we focus only on the parts of the model that need to improve by using a technique we developed in Microsoft Research called Low Rank Adaptive or LoRa Fine. That ended um, all this. Like, um, <laughs> I mentioned that GPT um, between the people. Okay, so now um, and I didn't even know that they actually confirmed it finally. Um, I was looking up, making, um, revising the slide yesterday night. I was just searching for the Google just once more to make sure that um, even though it's still obvious. Did they have have they not still um, confirmed it yet? And I just searched for Google for a while and found that video to finally see that oh, it was actually Laura. Okay, cool. So um, so now um, good. So we know that um, they used Laura, and Laura plus GPT was extremely expressive. Um, maybe for some people this makes sense, uh, but unless to me it wasn't very obvious. Like why is low rank update of the weight matrices in every layer? With very small rank, like one or two or three, why does it um, giving us enough flexibility to change the model to a completely different problem? And then if you think about it, it's completely not obvious. So I was looking for some theory work. Unfortunately, there was nothing. Unfortunately, there was nothing. So we started working on the theory problem to study the expressive power of low rank adaptation. This is the joint work with my student, Yu Chen, at uh, Wisconsin, and it's, uh, we posted on archive last month, so two months ago to look at. Now I see um, the formal definition of LoRa. So LoRa is um, consider one particular linear layer um, in your matrix, in your network. You have this free train rate matrix, which is converting uh, the D by D, so that's the matrix um, for now. And you want to fix this part frozen. And you only perturb this weight matrix by a low rank change or low rank update. And you can put some low rank constraint, or in fact, you can explicitly factorize this um, the difference by a product between a tall metric and a short and wide matrix. Then it always becomes a rank bounded by R. So you choose the number of um, rows and columns to be R so that you can always make sure that the, the extra components you are adding which is W plus A times C, this is always bounded by a rank bar. So that's, the, um, that's what LoRa is doing. Um, I talked about the successful examples of LoRa plus language models, but it's also extremely popular in the diffusion model, um, diffusion-based gener image generated models. So one of the, um, the current limitations of the current diffusion models are, even though you think that models are really good at doing anything that you give, especially value three is super impressive, Value three and also um, mid journey and better models are better and better at um, improving the fidelity in terms of which objects are in and the relationship between the object. But in terms of the stylization, uh, the models are still really bad. So, one of the, um, the failure examples that I really like is the draw something in terms of the Microsoft Paint style. You guys know what that means. So imagine that you are in elementary school, you're doing something as a teacher, and this is how it, it looks like, right? So can language like can the pre-trained uh, diffusion models or any image generated model can draw Microsoft Paint version of Tiana Leaves? It turns out that state art model gives you something like this. It kind of knows that you use a fewer number of colors and uh, simpler um, drawing styles, but it's in fact what we are looking for is something like this. So this is the um, untrained, um, um, unfine-tuned state digital model. This is a state digital model with you could be a parameter adapted with 10 million parameters LoRa now downloaded from here. Once you download this LoRa and combine this model parameter to give it your model, you can get perfect Microsoft Paint version of anything, which is pretty cool. Okay. So that's what um, 
um, people are doing with diffusion models these days. So the theory, what do I mean by theory? Um, there are, um, we consider the, the machine learning um, 101, um, there are three things that we people um, care about in theory. First, um, how, it, how expressive the function class is, or what is the approximation error? And second, how about the generalization? Third, um, can you actually find the model parameters, the optimization aspect? So these are the three things that theorists usually care about. In fact, um, nothing is known about LoRa in the literature yet. So um, we focus on the expressive power. There's some exception that um, studied the LoRa fine tuning in a very recent work by Sanjay Barora. Um, but they already looked at this um, LoRa fine tuning in the lazy training regime, which means they use an extremely small training lead so that um, the models are all linear, uh, the loss functions are all linearized, like a so called entity regime. All right, so um, let's see um, the formulation first. Um, we will assume that um, our goal is to learn this um, target function, which we use at bar, parameterize some neural network with the weight matrices W bar and B bar. The pre trained model or the frozen model, we start with another neural network parameterized by W and B. By introducing LoRa fine tuning, what we are doing is we update W with delta W, where this delta W is ranked bounded by R. Is the problem getting clear? So I'm starting from F naught, F zero, F naught, which has the model parameter W. I can only perturb this model parameter W using this um, delta W. This is frozen. This is my variable. My variable is a symmetric variable, has a rank constraint like this. So this is um, a former um, characterization of what LoRa is doing. And we call this um, this component as perfect that we defined in the earlier slide. So um, that's the general model. Let's start with the uh, even simpler model, uh, the deep linear model. The deep linear model, what I mean by that? Uh, the target model is the uh, linear model with one layer, W bar. And my pre trained model is an L layer deep linear model where I have um, W1 all the way to WL. In fact, this is still one linear model. One linear, it can be equivalent to, it is equivalent to the one layer linear model like this, but we still consider this um, deep linear model just to see uh, what the depths give us to. So LoRa adaptive model is also pretty similar. Um, so this multiplying this W i as it is, you have W i plus delta W i in each layer, and each of this delta W i or W l is right bound by R. So the question is, given F zero, which is the initial starting point, so this is going to be given to us F zero F one. We will be also given the target model. And we will be also given the, the rank bound, rank constraint. The question is, what is the best combination or best choice of this delta adapters to minimize the difference between my LoRa adapted model F and the target model? The ideal case is F it becomes exactly equal to F bar. If the rank is large enough, maybe that's possible. If the rank is small enough, um, you will have to um, suffer from some, some approximation gap. So this is the um, informal lemma uh, for the deep linear models. Let's see what this means. Intuitively, um, this problem becomes more difficult if your frozen model is, or pre-trained model is highly different from the target model. If the target model is close to your frozen model or pre-trained model, that means you're already starting close enough to the target model. So that difference is actually captured by just the difference between these two matrices. Okay, that's E. And also, um, given this rank R constraint, uh, what this quantity is meaning is if you find the optimal adapter for each layer, you're optimizing over all possible delta WI that is finding this rank constraint. Once you find that, the minimum operator norm difference between this target matrix and the lower adaptive linear operator is going to be equal to 
RL plus first singular value of E. Okay. So let's see what this means. Okay. Um, any questions so far? I'm just going to slow down a little bit here to make sure that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, R times L plus one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, great question. Here, I'm ignoring biases here. Yes, great question. Okay, so in fact, um, uh, okay, so it looks very similar to the Young theorem. Um, you guys have seen in the linear algebra courses before, which is going that um, if you have target metrics W, and you want to approximate W with rank R matrix X, the best approximation in this um, operator unknown is you have to take the um, first um, R singular vectors and throw away everything else. Therefore, the operator unknown difference would be R plus first singular value of the um, W. That's the known research. In fact, this is actually um, can be viewed as a generalized version of this one, where you are replacing this um, W with the product of this lower end of uh, But what's more important is this one. So imagine that this equally opposed, which is your rank is large enough so that it's larger than the rank of the error matrix divided by L. What that means is uh, RL will be larger than equal to rank of E. And R L plus one will be larger than rank of E. That means that um, there's no more uh, singular values than other than R L values. The R L plus first singular value of E will be zero, which tells me that um, the approximation error will be zero. So what it's saying is, well, if your low rank of the um, rank constant R, the minimum required uh, minimum low rank minimum low rank range required for getting the perfect approximation is satisfied by this. What does it mean? It's better if you have an error metric that has a smaller rank, which makes sense. And also, if you have a deeper pre-trained network, that helps. Does that make sense? So we see two different things. Um, it's better to start with the closer network in terms of the, um, the rank between the, the difference. And also, it's better if your pre-trained network has a deeper network, because L shows up like as in the denominator. Cool. Um, so, well, um, how do we prove it? I give you some some um, very high level proof ideas for proving in the simplest case where you have two layers and also the lower rank is D by half. Um, so consider that I want to find the condition where I can get the exact approximation, meaning that you get zero approximation error. What that means is I start with W2 and W1 as the you know, two layer matrices, weight matrices. I perturb this by W1, delta, delta W2, and each of them is rank bound by the half. But now I can, if I can find the solution to this equation, that it means that um, I can exactly represent the target linear function. Is that clear? So um, finding the sufficient condition to that uh, exact approximation boils, boils down to solving this matrix equation. Well, um, so this is um, constraint equation, um, this terms of equations with constraints is very tricky. So let's just use this, um, this factorization, um, the error factorization. Then you get to write this way. And if you rearrange the term and move this W2, W1 to the left hand side, then the error matrix becomes the left hand side, which is constant. Right hand side, you have this LR, L1, R1, L2, R2, and L2, R2, L1, R1, and also some constant W1, W2. So it becomes, um, turns out, um, this finding the sufficient condition boils down to solving a fourth order matrix equation. And in general, it becomes um, two times um, L times order matrix equation, but in this case, L is two, so we have four order matrix equation. And it's all about how to solve this matrix equation. Um, I'll skip the details because um, if you um, try solving this equation, maybe you can figure out a solution maybe in 20 minutes. It's not a difficult equation. Just look at the um, how the uh, equations look like, and you have to somehow figure out the 
the systematic uh, ways to solve these equations um, line by line, then you can figure out the closed form solution for this equation. Uh, but it's a good exercise if you are um, uh, willing to see what the actual proof is. And extending this proof to the general cases is basically the proof for the general cases. Any questions so far? Uh, on metrics, you mentioned this is to the AB matrix for the. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it should be um, NRAB. I'm, yeah. using, I'm mixing the application. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, that was for deep linear network. Um, can you extend it to more realistic models? Yes. Uh, we extend it to the nonlinear uh, activations. Um, and also, we extend it to the transformer network. There are some limitations. Uh, for the linear network cases, uh, what we were um, showing in the previous map map was, was actually the, um, the, uh, the exact characterization of the minimum rank unit. Basically, we were, our approximation error was not even bound, it was the exact approximation error, the optometric approximation error. Yeah. For nonlinear network cases, um, we only have an upper bound on the approximation error, so we still don't have the tight um, lower bound. That's open. For transformer networks, uh, we only have um, results for for the case where the target network and the pre-trained networks are of the same depth. We don't have any theory yet for different depth species. So that's some limiting um, because of our um, limited proof techniques. Um, that's also open there. And so one um, question that I can answer here is how do I handle this nonlinear activation? Because it seems like your proof technique is very specific to linear. So in fact, yes, it is almost specifically designed for linear cases. We were using this um, some simple proof trick from this paper from um, Angeliki and um, Shashang Dimitri, uh, with, with my, who are my colleagues. Uh, the idea was extremely simple. So three simple proof techniques that I just shared with you here. Let's say our target network is now one layer value network. So it's the same linear network, but you have a value at here. My pre-trained network is also L layer, and now every layer has value. Okay, so you cannot anymore see that like WL and multiply all the way to W1 showing up here because of this value matrices. So the simplest trick is going back to the question about the biases. We are actually using biases here to get rid of the intermediate values by increasing the um, activation values sufficiently large enough to get rid of the value by activating every neuron. Once you activate every neuron, the internal values are already disappearing. And then now you can see that same um, product showing up. Then you apply the proof technique that we used before. And then later on, you have to uh, um, somehow remove the offset coming from that extra biases by handling this bias term. But um, it's a pretty obvious thing that once you see that, what I mean by increasing the bias term so that you turn on all the neurons, that it becomes completely linear. All right. Um, so, how much time I have? Maybe 15 more minutes? 20 minutes. So practical implications, I will quickly go through them. So you can actually, um, one of the implications from our theory is we can show that LoRa is strictly better than fine-tuning the last layers. The fine-tuning the last layers has been the, the most um, standard fine-tuning methods for computer vision methods, especially when we are dealing with a like, pre-trained ResNet or pre-trained AlexNet. We used to train the last layers while freezing the most of the inner layers. Assuming that we use, um, we have a good feature representation or feature extractor, we will use to train the last few layers. And imagine that um, um, if that's the uh, if the feature is actually useful for your own task or downstream task, that's fine. But if your downstream task do not use the same feature that was pre-trained, then final layer tuning is um, is provably bad. While LoRa, it is good because you are training every layer little by little, so you have an ability to adapt your features. Because you're you not just using the fixed feature extractor, you're using a new feature that is adapted to your best then announcing task. The other implication we have is, well, as I talked about uh, before, we have this R times L showing up, which is rank times depth of the pre-trained model. So that basically means that even though that was coming from the linear model and also the, um, the upper bound on the non-linear model, we have this RL term showing up, which basically means that the expressive power of LoRa is somehow proportional to R times L. In other words, um, if you're having a deeper model, which also makes sense because if you think about the number of um, degrees of freedom in the uh, LoRa adaptation, 
the number of degrees of freedom are actually proportional to rank times x of the freezing one. So here we are running some experiments with Roberta. So we first looked at the distribution of performance with Roberta, and you can see that um, the performance there is basically like not clear which one is better than the other. But once you do Laura fine tuning, we are giving three times larger rank to the base model to compensate the, um, the depth difference. And then like you are seeing, uh, we still see that large models are better than the first one because the, um, the large models are much deeper than base and also much wider than the base model. So even if you're giving more rank, it's clearly showing that um, what matters is rank times depth. Um, there are a few. Uh, sure, go ahead. Can you briefly explain that how that those techniques can be extended to transformers? Oh, uh, yes. Um, transformers, um, yes, it's actually slightly different group techniques, but you can think about. Um, let just go through the good question. So, so uh, let's go back to this matrix equation. Imagine that uh, what we were doing was basically solving this kind of matrix equation. Where you have target matches, and you want to solve this, um, you want to approximate the target matches with some product. Um, if you look at the transformer architecture, then um, what you have is this key value matrices and coring matrices. And if you um, look at this, basically you get, you know, let's say QX and QK, uh, KX and transpose, it becomes transpose K, transpose QX showing up in the transformer, right? In fact, so here you are getting this um, multiplication showing up, right? So what happens in transformer proof is something very similar to this. Now you have this um, natural multiplication weight matrices showing in the transformer layer. So now you have this K plus um, delta K, so it's shear such slide like this, read delta LK, 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 RK, and Q plus, LQ, RQ, and this should be equal to K target, Q target. Now it becomes another uh, matrix equation that you have to solve, and you can use a similar technique to solve these equations. Well, I'm a little confused that so we can represent the rock bound for each layer, but uh, in previous, uh, if we're the bit network, we have some working for layers, so if yes. it's a layer, then we get the, we can use the word that, but those yeah. also work with that. So great question. So that's why um, I can briefly mention um, in this slide that transformer network, uh, we only have um, reserved for name size transformers where the pre-trained models and target networks are the same like this, um, which is in our paper. Um, in fact, we have a um, uh, revision, which is um, gonna include the, um, the extension of this technique so that you can also include uh, layers um, and combine multiple layers. But that requires a little bit of adaptation, changes to the architecture. So it's a bit more sophisticated. But, yeah. but the default um, paper we have right now, archive only has this one, which matches layer by layer. Great question, thanks. All right, so um, move on. I skip this one. Um, and wrap up the Dora part um, with saying that, uh, well, our first research is basically giving some insights about how expressive LoRa is. It actually goes through the whether this um, model is pretty or not, uh, whether your uh, LoRa rank is, um, how this LoRa rank affects the approximation bound, and also how does model depth affect the approximation bound as well. And there are uh, so many open problems that are uh, really challenging. Uh, the higher bounds um, than ours is still open. Optimization and generalization aspect of LoRa are completely open yet. And also, um, there are some people who started looking at this um, idea of LoRa, not for just for fine tuning, but also for rank fine tuning or training from scratch. And there are some ideas that are um, very interesting out there. So it's worth looking into it. All right. Um, so I think I have about 15 minutes left. So I will spend about um, less than 10 minutes on the memorization part. And we'll talk about the last part for about five minutes. Uh, so this is joint work with my former postdoc, um, Professor Son at Yonsei and his students, and also my colleague, uh, Professor Tuan and so So, <clears throat> so in the previous model project, we were considering the, uh, the function approximation uh, approach to study the, the approximation errors. So now, um, 
Well, um, what about um, the finite data set? Uh, when we have a finite data set, we probably want to have a different um, notion of expressivity. So this is one um, approach we did. So I'll give you the problem set first. So consider that we are given a fine tuning data set. Um, there are n data points, x1 to y1, x1, y1, all the way to x, n, y, m. And we will just assume that y is already function of I am also given a free train network F0, F0, and the prediction made by this F0 on every xi, I will define as yi tilde. That's the initial um, predictions made by free train model. So what we are assuming is, well, okay, so you're using, as long as you're choosing a right, correct free train model, your initial predictions are going to be good for large amount of samples that are having there that you have in the pre-trained fine data set. So but still will be incorrect on some number of samples in your data set. So that's our model. In other words, out of n samples, on n samples, the pre-training model will make some incorrect guesses. On n minus t, which is n minus n samples in your fine data set, Pre-training model will already give you the correct answer. In this case, consider this as a regression test. Okay. Uh, is the setting clear? So um, by definition um, of the pre-training model, we are assuming that n is small enough. Okay, let's give you a, let me give you an example. So um, you have five um, samples in your fine tuning data set, and I'm visualizing the data set, x1, y1, all the way to x5, y1. Now I want to see how good my pre-trained model is on this particular task. So I plug in x1 all the way to x5. I visualize the predictions like this. You can see that um, the first and second fifth one are correct. And the third one and fourth one are not correct. So now here n is five, um, small n is two. And the goal is I want to fix this um, behavior of the pre-trained network as efficient as possible. So what do I need to do is I need to just move this thing down below, move that one down here without changing the other prediction values. Then I'm um, successfully fine tuning this pre trained model. Is that clear? So how do I do that? Um, so in, for this aspect, uh, for this problem, we are going uh, to use this uh, fine tuning method called sign tune. So sign tune is a method that is used by computer vision by Berkeley. What they are doing is you keep the original network completely frozen. And you introduce a small neural network that also takes x as an input, output something, such that f plus g becomes um, the final model. This is extremely difficult. So basically, your pre trained model is f naught. You introduce a small network g, f naught plus g is your final model. That's fine tuned model. So, fine tuned model is literally addition of two functions one pre trained model, one fine tuned, uh, newly introduced fine tuning model. So what does that mean? So now, if you look at the side tune, my F naught, which has these two problematic labels right now here, can be fixed if your side network is predicting 0, 0, 0 for the correct responses and some negative values for incorrect responses. And if you just add this two side network output and the pre-trained output, you will get the um, perfect output that fits the fine tuning Is that clear? So then the question is, uh, cool. Um, so how large G should be to be able to do this? That's my, uh, that's our research question. So more precisely, we want to fit um, arbitrary fine tuning data set of n samples. So my, uh, arbitrary fine tuning data, fine, not fine tuning data, arbitrary. Um, let me just define the name of this data. So this is the kind of correction data set, right? This is the output of um, G should have. So for any um, such correction that G has to make, out of, um, so out of N samples, you have um, N non-zero spikes. And N minus N samples are having zero values. That's the definition we have. Okay. If you want to um, be able to fit any such combinations, how large G should be? That's the question we have. And our theorem is that, in fact, we can Fully characterize the um, exact um, fundamental bound of n as a function of n and m, which is 
like up to constant one, you can see that it's minimum of three times n and m. I um, just want to highlight that this um, is actually the, uh, the generalization of the concept defined in this paper, which I really recommend you to read. It's called the, um, the uh, they, they define some concept called memorization capacity, which is basically the, uh, the tool to analyze how expressive a model is at memorizing a, a finite data set with arbitrary labels. And we are actually using this concept to analyze the fine tuning capacity. And um, it's highly um, recommended to read that paper. So, how do we prove this? Um, it's extremely simple. So, I just go through the proof um, pretty quickly. So, the lower bound on M. So, what do we mean by lower bound on M? Uh, we want to uh, find the, the number of neurons that are required such that you can fit any arbitrary data set. That have uh, n spikes and n samples. So you actually have to consider the worst case data that requires us to receive as many as neurons as possible. Okay. So how do I fit um, given data? So I just throw it over here. I'm like going over. Yeah, I just drew over this thing. So, so it's, I'm considering the two layer running network, which means that your network looks like bracket here. And you have a multiple on value units here. So basically, add this thing back. This is two layer running And what this is basically doing is, is summing up multiple value functions. With different weight and different slope and different locations, right? Um, so even if you give, if you give me any fine tuning data set, any data set I have to fit, I can always fit this m samples. Let's say I given this m samples like this, zero zero zero. Let's say um, zero non zero non zero zero zero. What I can do is I can always start with one level function that looks like this, and I can always um, I can always make design a value function at one level neuron to look like this. And I can also design one more value function to go down like this. And I can just literally uh, interpolate every sample label by label. So if you design, uh, this is basically the summation of this value plus this value plus this value and so forth. So this can be actually represented as some of the uh, one, one, two, three, four, five random neurons. So if you're giving me, if you give me m data point, I can always fit it no matter which values they have. I can fit it with m minus one neurons for sure. So that's the um, that's the um, so that's the thing that you can always have. But in fact, um, the three n plus one is more interesting thing. So because if you have um, you could potentially have um, more efficient construction, which is if you have a bunch of zeros and you have some one non zero here. So, what you can have is you can actually connect multiple zeros in one chain, right? So, multiple zeros, uh, consecutive zeros, you don't need to use multiple neurons uh, to fit this again and again. So, you can actually save the number of neurons in that way. So in fact, um, that's how you actually prove the upper bound uh, because upper bound is about you come up with different schemes to fit the data. Lower bound um, is also pretty much the same because you have to show the, um, the worst case data set where um, the number of cases is maximized, but which is basically the same as um, the construction that we have. So um, that's the um, love proof sketch, um, but I'll talk more about it if you're interested in the upper end. We can also extend this to the three layer cases where um, the values of values again, so the proof technique becomes much more involved, but you can still show that um, how this M is characterized. <clears throat> All right, so um, I'm gonna move on to the last part. Um, let's have five minutes to quickly showcase um, what you can do without any fine tuning. So we were just talking about um, given LLM, let's find a little bit. 
But what about the other route? I guess everyone is now familiar with prompt engineering, in context learning. You're not changing your model parameters, but you are just changing um, the inputs you're providing um, to the model. Instead of just giving your um, actual input from the problem, you give some extra um, prefix or some extra text or extra samples to somehow steer the model to behave as you wish. So uh, let's first consider the prompted language models. Um, this one is actually um, one of the ongoing work um, I have with my student, Chi Qian. Um, let me get one, one last quote for this. Okay. Uh, I guess in context learning, if you're giving multiple samples in your context to somehow tell the model that this is, I want you to solve this problem. And this K is the number of context examples. So, and then imagine that you want to draw the performance of in context learning with X axis is um, number of in context examples. Y axis is the accuracy as you provide more and more um, samples. So which of this ABC curve um, is the right curve that describes the in-context learning performance behavior? A, raise your hand. Now you get more in-context examples, will the accuracy be better or worse? Any guess? A, raise your hand. Okay, a few. B, goes down and up. C, okay, YC. Any, anyone? Um, any reason for C? So, um, so the answer is, okay, good, cool. interesting. So the, the typical um, um, uh, understanding of context learning is actually based on aim. You're doing some kind of learning with samples given in context. So you're giving um, more and more samples, so statistically you're better and better. So A is basically the, um, the standard way of um, doing it. Of course, you could also start overfit the sample that you're given. So you can also go down, or you can also have some, um, in practice, you may have some performance degradation if you give more and more in context samples. Your context is not able to capture all of the samples in the sample, in the context, so you can also have that performance going up, going down. What's crazy about this B, the B is actually something that is referred to in the original GPT-3 paper. They actually show that zero shot is better than one shot. Zero shot is better than one shot on two of the four tasks they tested. And they have no way, they said, I don't know why it's happening. So um, maybe it's just open AI's fault. Um, maybe they didn't run enough in averages. Later on, um, um, Xie et al, uh, they also reproduced the exact um, behavior. This Nike curve is completely reproduced in their paper too. So where does this Nike curve coming from, right? Why is zero shot better than one shot, two shot, and suddenly it goes up? So, um, so far there was no theory um, or any explanation that explains this. This paper has one line explanation, which is not I think, complete yet. Uh, we kind of came up with this um, probabilistic model that explains why this Nike model is happening. In fact, we are doing this loss from our model, but it's um, inverse of Nike model. So, um, Super excited about this one. Um, I don't have any uh, full drafts ready to share with you, but if you guys are curious about it, I can share this with you. So please let me know. Um, just have a few more minutes. So I'll just talk about what about other in context learning you can imagine. So we talked about this um, text, text in context learning, now, numbers or text. That's what we usually know about. You can also define visual in context learning. You can think about these four by four images, put these three images, then now you can say, that, hey, that fill this gap. And you can see that. Um, from the first two images in the first row, you can also learn what the task you're looking for. You can also do visual um, image to text in context learning, like this, description, description, so that you can describe it, and also describe where they are coming from. You can also do the opposite. This is something that um, we are testing these days. Uh, this, um, the newer um, model, model I see the language models are also able to throw. You can also give some more complex questions like this. You give prompt like red and red green card image, green and green card card image, and black and black card image, and you just give blue. And the model is actually able to understand what the um, the parent in this sequence of images and text. You could able to draw this blue card. So this is uh, the most difficult in context learning you could test, and we are testing this in context learning abilities on multiple models that are out there, and this will be also released by uh, by the end of this month. So keep your eyes on it.
So we are showing that uh, with in-context learning, you can do a lot of different things. I will briefly talk about the prompted uh, network of prompted language models and build that development of students. The prompted language models is powerful, um, but if you have a system of prompted language models, or if you have a network of prompted language models, it became even more powerful. Some people call it like uh, an agent. Um, some people um, have some framework defined uh, this and then chain or all these crazy things. There you go. So why is this happening? So for the image classification, it was always a masking from high dimensional input to the lower dimensional input, like label or something like that. There's no way of reusing the output to augment the, um, your answer. Language models are always like text to text. So you can keep using based on your answer and you can keep um, using it how many times you want. You can have a tree or just called tree of thought, graph of thought, you can do anything you want. So the fundamental difference comes from this. Why have we have not thought about this before? We were not having any model that has high dimension input to the high dimension input output that could be reused again and again. In fact, the exception is image noiser that came about the same time in 2019-18 um, by distributed models. Um, and in fact, now I view the video model as nothing but with noiser in a loop. And I have some um, um, a series of diffusion model works. If you want to talk about it, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so why is this making sense? In theory, we show that uh, language models in a loop can actually simulate a uh, Turing computer. So um, this is the paper that we show that um, if you carefully construct the weight of the transformer and put it in a loop, there's no different from a computer um, um, which actually computes one instruction of the program code, output the memory update, and you keep feeding back, and that happens again and again, and you can execute any program you want. So check out our GitHub code because we actually constructed um, this our computer-ish transformer. You can download it and you can actually program your own code, feed it to the transformer, and if you keep running transformer again and again, you can run any code. You can have a simulator um, inside the transformer. I'll quickly go through it. I have um, worked on this LLM agent um, because it makes sense because you can always implement any like um, chatbot. We actually state of the art uh, for the uh, cheap state of the art performance on uh, chatbot system, which was crazy because as I mentioned, I never took any NLP courses. And just by connecting five GPTs in a loop, we achieved the state of the art um, chatbot performance with audio this year, beating the um, Blenderbot 3 from Meta. We also um, showed that LLM agent can solve a um, mystery game for the first time. We also showed that LLM agent is able to achieve the state of the art image clustering performance. This is a new paper that we just posted. Uh, so take a look at it. Uh, with LLM agent, um, it's not just LLM agent, multimodal LLM agent can actually achieve the state of the art image clustering on many data sets. And what's great about this thing is when you are doing image clustering, most of the traditional methods, don't have any way to specify what you want to cluster these images based on. You just basically use the implicit conditions given by your features or, or loss function you use. But here, um, our method is allowing users to use or specify, hey, I want to cluster based on images based on blah, blah, blah. Is that examples? If I want to cluster images based on action, they are making this is output. Location, mood, you literally type in your um, criterion text and that can give you different clustering results. It's really good at understanding what's doing. So if you choose K equals two and K equals five, K equals two, you have two different clusters and you get, and also our research um, algorithm is pretty cute because it also gives you the name for each cluster you find. So the name of the cluster up there is not what we found, not we, not we wrote down, annotated, it actually found by the model itself. So you can see that when K equals two, it actually split the instrument into Brass and string, when case five, um, case seven, it gives trumpet, blues, cello, guitar, and so forth. So yeah, that's about it. Um, so the problem is um, I don't have, I don't think there's any theory about what we can do with this, um, this looped model, prompt models in the system. It's completely open. And what if, if you also do looping with, together with fine tuning, that's also um, more expressivity, but we don't know anything about it. So I want to um, end up uh, and the result at the top by giving this um, the last sentence here. The prompting and looping is actually it reminds me of the system design. Like I was um, studied um, trained as an e system student, 
with signal systems, communication systems, where you learn how to combine different chips and design a, a linear system, nonlinear systems, and analyze how the systems uh, of chips are working and how to analyze the system. Trying to redevelop this um, system theory for LLM systems. That's what I'm calling for. Um, we don't have anything yet we can use right now, and I'm happy to study more. Uh, and this is the joint work with my student and other collaborators here and there. And thanks for listening. And sorry for going over time. Thanks so much. Thanks for your great talk, And I think we are a little over time, but we have time for maybe a few questions. Yeah, uh, my question is that uh, are we uh, happy with the low rank total for the Python test, or do you think we need to come up with uh, more sophisticated like, matrix structures for uh, getting the better like, Python results? Oh, yeah, um, uh, th that's a great question. Um, the short answer is I don't know. Yeah, short answer is um, so far. Um, there are, I also personally try to develop a better fine tuning method that can outperform LoRa for a while. And I um, basically failed for, um, for about a year. Uh, I had some like very marginal gains here and there, but I didn't have any um, success in developing a better method. Um, there are many uh, variants of LoRa that are strictly better than the vanilla LoRa, but still they are based on the LoRa uh, philosophy. Um, I don't know whether this is fundamentally the best one. I don't think so, but I think still we are kind of stuck in the um, the phase where LoRa is pretty much the best one right now. Um, that doesn't mean that it's the best one, um, but it's a really good question and I don't have good answers. Yeah, I would call like the rest of the system calls you know, like linear convergence systems. And like, what kind of like what mathematical model would you foresee like happening? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, um, for NLM systems, I have no ideas, um, but I'll give you one example um, about this image in the meter. So here, um, I actually use the tools from control theory for analyzing diffusion models. Diffusion models, um, once you take the, um, the traditional viewpoint like score estimation or PD or the, those kind of viewpoints do not give you um, this way of thinking. But once you view this um, diffusion model as nothing but a control system, where image denoiser is a like one controller and you have just a controller group, then you can start bringing some ideas from control theory for reinforcement learning. And in fact, that's why um, this paper is the first paper that uses reinforcement learning algorithm to train diffusion models. And this is also the second paper that uses diffusion models, reinforcement learning to train diffusion models with human rewards. So, those are the um the new ideas. So I think I'm pretty uh, happy with that kind of like simple observation that diffusion model is a control system. So why should we use reinforcement learning or control theory? Um, and it turns out nobody has done it. So this was the same work, and we were uh, far ahead of the others. So that we can use a human reward as a reward function to apply the RL algorithm. So that's one example. But of course, we didn't have any clean theory uh, we could apply here. It was just like the conceptual connection helped us develop better methods. Um, probably at least uh, we can start with that for elements too, um, but I don't have good answers. That's why um, I'm proposing that we should um, all think about it. Hello, I have a question. Oh yeah, um, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I have a specific question. If I want to find you a model for my like code generation task, uh, what how many data do do I need, and how many iteration do I need to train? And these kind of scaling law, uh, questions. Do you have any like high level idea of how to choose these? So, so sure. Um, if I understand your question, your question is um, if you want to have a, a model language code language model. How much data do we need? Is that your question? Yeah, in general, like the scaling law of like LoRa. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So um, it's a super interesting question because um, the question is how much data do we need? And also mentioned the scaling law. Um, what I um, believe is the current scaling law, um, I guess everyone has heard about the scaling law where you increase the model size, your perplexity goes down, you increase more data, perplexity goes down. What I am personally not satisfied about the current scaling law is, is using the homogeneous data. Uh, it's the same data um, across the axis. What I mean by that is, 
um, you are using the same amount of data, IID data, um, but just larger and smaller amount of data across the axis. That's how the scaling law is defined. But in fact, if you think about, um, let's say, hey, for 10 billion parameter models, what if, if I can optimally choose the right data composition for training 10 billion models? And for 1 billion model, I may, um, instead of choosing this one tenth of this 10 billion data set, I choose completely different data set optimized for training 1 billion model. And, and so first, if I design the optimal data set for different model sizes, the scaling law will be completely different. So in fact, um, this is something that people are trying to understand more and more, like um, the model size depend on the data optimization. If you assume that optimal um, data composition can be made for each of the model size, and then we will probably in a few years see a different scaling law curve. And I don't know how that will look different from what we have right now, especially for the coding model. Uh, the recent work from MSR is showing that a very small model, very small amount of coding data from the textbook-like data set is good enough to train a good coding model. So in fact, uh, even the model size now they are using is all these um, fee models are 1 billion model parameters and so forth. So um, the short answer is, if you're considering a particular test, um, and if you really care about how to construct your data set, um, the model size and data set size be super small. Got it. Thank you so much. And I think I have some question in the chat from Kimia. Uh, what is why is it um, helpful to consider the guarantees on the um, e, which is not known uh, at training time? That's a great question. So in fact, um, it's a purely theoretical guarantee that shows that, of course, uh, we don't know what the target model is in practice. And we don't know what E metrics is. So what we are guaranteed saying is we just show that there exists um, a good low rank adapters, um, because <laughs> assuming that their target model exists, even though you don't know. So these theoretical guarantees are mostly for showing the existence. And what we are saying is since this model exists, uh, we have to we have a hope to find these good adapters once these conditions are satisfied. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can actually construct the lower adapters using these equations we have because our equations or construction require the, the E matrix, which is unknown to the um, to the learner. Does that, I hope that answers your question. Do you think that explanation is not enough for this? Oh, you mean this curve or yeah. this curve? Oh, big, the big curve. Big curve. Yeah. What is your explanation? Uh, if if the overheading is just to start to contact the so if you have a two shoe, you have a continuity space that you can move in the and you have a device. Do you think that's not enough? Like, huh? Um, I think it's a, a great um explanation, but I don't think it fully explains it because. Uh, in the standard, um, the classic statistical learning, when the work really happens, yeah. um, it should keep happening unless you're assuming double the same. Okay, um, because like the work really happens um, in the later phase of statistical learning. If you if, it, if the model already starts overfitting, if you give more and more examples, the work really should become even worse. Right. So in statistical learning, we do have to have this overfitting happens first, um, and then like. Overfitting goes away. It, the only exception is the double descent, where um, you start learning first, and then the overfitting happens, and then due to double descent, it goes up. So, um, if this curve was like goes up and down and up, it could be explained by double descent, like um, overfitting, uh, first learn, overfit, and then it comes back. Um, but what we are seeing in practice is it starts overfitting right away. So I'm um, not sure whether you can explain via double descent, um, but we have a different way of explaining it. Of course, I don't think, I don't know whether uh, we have no guarantee that this is the, the right explanation. We at least can explain the uh, same phenomenon using some of our probabilistic model. Thanks. Thanks, Nelson.